Good afternoon and good evening for another very special edition of Diary of a Double. This is the year long journey of our guest and our host and our mentor and our inspiration, Antonio Aguelas, <laughs> who's going to swim from England to France and then back from France to England, a total of 67 kilometers. Welcome, Antonio. Thanks, Stephen. A pleasure, like um, every Saturday, to be with you and with all this open water swimming community, wherever they are in the world. And, um, and I, I'm in Cuernavaca today, Stephen. Okay. Um, I, I'm at my parents' house and um, finishing a very complicated week, you know? Why so? Remember last week, I told you I had gone um, to Las Estacas and I had a very um, tough week. You bumped and, in, um, swam into a <laughs> branch. Yeah, and um, and um, my when we were doing weights, I had a, a very a small injury in my back, and and then the next day my lower back hurt, and then on Sunday Rafa said and uh, my doctor said go and have for your your blood uh, taken, um, so we will look at all the different parameters, and um, nothing to to be overly concerned. But some of my parameters were, you know, signing that I, that I was um, a little bit had gone over a little bit of my in my in my training, yeah. um, and um, so this week we had to be very careful to get back to the levels um, that would allow me next week to go and swim for two weeks in California. So this has been a, a week where you know every day I um, I have to 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 check how I feel and, and depending how we're feeling, um, that's what uh, Rafa gives me for, for workout. And I wanted to point it out because in, in, in our generation, you would always want to be feel tired and tired and tired. And you, know, you went out in the morning and the afternoon, you had to be tired and tired. And um, Rafa has shown me that uh, taking rest, even in the middle of the season, nothing bad uh, will happen. And if you don't look at yourself, something can happen. Next week, you will be in California, correct? Yes, I'm going to La Jolla from uh, Monday till Thursday, and then I'm going to San Francisco. Okay. Um, I'll, be, I'll be for a, another five or so six days in San Francisco. So um, I'll, we'll see how the, how the weather, uh, how the water temperature. I know in, in La Jolla has gone up a little bit, yeah, uh, it's not 14 degrees anymore, and um, San Francisco. Uh, Suzanne wrote me the other day that it has gone up a little bit as well. Okay. So we'll hopefully I'll have a nice, um, nice weather. Yeah, what I what I think is really interesting for today's discussion was the fact that you started out as a competitive swimmer. You trained, you know, many miles, um, uh, many kilometers. Um, you always looked at the pace clock. Um, you did sets, uh, you still do sets. Um, you do things like negative splitting and descending intervals and <laughs> descending effort and, you know, all these different things. And now you are a channel swimmer. Your goal is to walk in, swim across and walk out. So from your many years of, of training up at Stanford and, and California and Mexico City, in the pool as a competitive swimmer, and then all your years of swimming from one shore to the other, what are some really, really common differences between those two? Well, I would say that the first one is I'm never nervous when I'm gonna cross, uh, swim across an ocean. Um, it's, uh, that's something that uh, it disappears. And when you're on a starting block, even if you are very confident, even if you had a great season, um, the jitters are totally different. I mean, the feeling of how you feel in a pool is totally different than when you go in the ocean. Yeah. I mean, that would be the number one um, big difference. The second one, and this is really interesting, Stephen, is the, the tapering. When you're, an, when you're a, a pool swimmer, the taper is it's like, it's like, like the harvest of the season. I mean, you could, you, could, you, you could have trained very, very well the whole year. And if those two last two weeks don't go well, your times are not gonna be well. 
Yeah. And that, that's, that, that puts a lot of pressure, um, I guess, on the coaches, but on the swimmers as well, because yeah. I don't know if in, in today's um, atmosphere in the swimming, um, in, in the competitive swimming world, they have designed a, a consistent and scientific way to uh, taper. But in my, in my years, it was just like, how do you feel? And, and you know, it was like, you know, let, let's see how it goes. And, and you had to be learning things. All, all, all along the time. And in open water swimming is, you go, for example, now that I'm going to be going to England, I'm going to be arriving um, about uh, nine days before, um, you know, trying to get into the, 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 the time difference. But, uh, you know, my, my training is going to be mostly like I do some other days. I mean, it's not a big taper, no, no, not, and it's not so stressful. Yeah. Um, then the, the third thing is, when you, you know, I guess in my, in a, when you do sets in the water um, as a competitive swimmer, you always have a reference. I mean, if you want to go under, you know, uh, let's say, let's do uh, 100, 100s on a 120 or a 115. And then, you know, you can hold 110 or 18 for, for that many, many, so much time. And that you have an idea of how much you need for the 1500 or for the 400. So everything you do in the pool has a reference on what's going to happen on race days. Um, in, when, I, when I'm training for open water, that's not the case. When I'm training for open water is what are the tools that I'll be using while I swim that I have to do in the pool and then take to the ocean. Let me give you three, three examples. Number one is uh, this idea that I have to find an R3. My R3 is going to be my cruising time when I'm in the, in the ocean. And Rafa um, wants me to be below two minutes. Uh, we started at about 2.12. And, you know, we've guessed that two, two minutes is about 140 in the water. So, you know, for a lot of people, 140 is, is like, you know, taking a shower in a jacuzzi. But, hold, you know, holding 140, it's very rigorous. So when I, when I do a, a pace in the water, and I have to transfer that feeling when I'm in the ocean. The second thing that we've talked about is what happens if you encounter, if you encounter um, different currents and different situations. You have to have the, the explosivity to be able to overcome those problems. And um, that's, that's something that we do. And then the big, big, big difference is a mental uh, state. I mean, open water swimming, as we have said here, is about 80% uh, mental. And, um, and you have, to, you know, in, in, in a 400 freestyle, you, you know, you have, you know, four laps and you have to concentrate on flaps, you know, and you're going to go under, you know, four, hour, four minutes, you know, these days. Uh, <laughs> when you swim 24 hours, you have a lot of time with your mind. So those would be, you know, my, my, initial, my initial thoughts of what's the difference between racing and, and, uh, and doing ocean swimming. Yeah. Yeah. I, I also might add, there's one other for most people. And that is uh, in a pool, when you're racing, you're always comparing, or most of the time you're comparing yourself to the person who swims in the lane next to you, the person who swims in the lane to the other side of you and your best time. So there's always, you're, you're, you're a competitive swimmer. When yeah. you're at the shore of England, you're not really competing against anybody. You're just, it's yourself and, and mother nature. And um, now there's some people, let's say uh, Petr Stoichev, who wants to set an English channel record. In this case, yes, he's got a certain goal time in, in mind, but in most cases, the, the goal is to walk in, swim across and, and walk out. Um, but I, I wanna discuss this mental aspect. Um, the fact that you, many athletes are nervous there's a lot of adrenaline running when they step up to the racing block at a pool. And then you, as you put your uh, Vaseline and lanolin on and swing your arms, do your exercise, and you walk on the sand to the shore or jump off the boat to swim to shore. I would think a 400 freestyle, even at the highest level, you, you've done that so many times. And it seems to me it would be easy to be very relaxed about that. And in the case of an uncontrollable 
a water that's moving, you know, un, uh, dynamically, you have no idea what's going on and you're jumping in the water, I would think that would make you quite nervous, but you're the reverse. And I, no. I can you explain why? Well, before, before I explain, don't think I don't compete against people in the pool, <laughs> Stephen. I have to say that I, I was beaten this morning badly, Stephen. And a one and a one hundred freestyle today, I was beaten um, by a friend of mine um, just just by the touch. But it doesn't feel very good when you lose, uh, even even if you are an open water swimmer. Yeah. Um, no, let me tell you. You know, as you were explaining, I was thinking myself on the on the starting block for a hundred meter freestyle. Okay. And my 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 gut started to to crumble because because just just think. I mean, you're going to go out. And you have to, to think of different things. The first one is you cannot, in a 400, at least when I swam them, I don't know how they swim it today, you can't go all out. I mean, you have to go fast enough to be in that sweet spot that you're gonna be able to conserve your energy in the second 100, go better in the third and go all out in the fourth. And your goal is to be, my, my goal used to be the third and the fourth will be the fastest one. The pain, that you can experience in those 400 or in the 1500, the pain you're going to experience in your, you know, Queen is laughing. <laughs> the pain, the pain you're going to, you're going to, you're going to experience in, in your gut, in your body. It's very high, very, very high. So, and, um, and, and as you know, you're going to be between eight, you're going to be between the first and the eighth. So that's, that's gonna, what's going to happen. In yeah. open water swimming, you know, and this is something that I tell people, just, just let me give you an example. I still hold the Mexican record to having swam at age 50 with one of my arms totally gone, the fastest Mexican Catalina swim, 10 hours and 25 minutes. Much faster pool swimmers, you know, some of them Olympics that went to the Olympics, haven't broken my record. And, and what I, it, it, this is about, you know, competing. And every time somebody says something about it, I said, it was just pure luck. I mean, I had a wonderful day. Um, the currents were probably in my favor. So you never, I never talk about times in, in, in the ocean. You cannot compare your times with somebody else. Um, my first, uh, uh, my first uh, um, channel was 18 hours and 19 minutes. 10 years later, I went 12 hours and 52. And if I'm lucky, you know, at 62, one of my laps is going to be faster than that. Um, so, so um, that's the big difference. And, and and you know what? When you are, <laughs> you told me this. This is this is. I I, I will quote Stephen Munatonis. It's so easy for a swimmer in open water to swim the 25 meters to the boat and finish a race. You're never going to get out of a hard 400. <laughs> Just imagine you have the 300, you get out. No, in open water, in open water swimming, you know if anything goes wrong, you are you have the boat next to you. I mean, you don't want to use it, but but that at least uh, some of those are some of the things that come to my mind. That uh, that is just that for me, it's just the enjoyment, the enjoyment of getting in the ocean and and just uh, the beauty of of an, of encountering the different things that you you. you you encounter when you are in there. Yeah. Stephen, can I, can I chime in with, with a thought? Um, so Antonio, I was, I was laughing thinking about, uh, you know, the fear of the pain uh, standing up on the, on the blocks. And I think that's part of it, but it also you're trying to control every single aspect of a pool swim race, you know, from nailing that first turn to when you're going to breathe off the wall and the, the, mental uh, focus that that takes is very different from being agile and prepared for unexpected occurrences the way you would in open water. I think that's, that's a, it's a totally different approach in psychology. So I just wanted to add, add on to that. Yeah. The other thing too, um, because you're, you're focused in the pool on, let's say eight laps or two laps or one lap, whatever, whatever it is, but when you're, for example, in Antonio's case, the planning for a channel swim involves the pilot, the crew, an international flight, uh, 
getting a vaccine, all these things. So the actual swim is, is seems to me is a, a smaller portion than the total amount of mental effort that, that any channel swimmer has to put in. Whereas in the pool, it's almost exclusively in the pool. I mean, yes, you're, ta- you're thinking about the taper, which will be our next topic, or your nutrition or how your shoulders feel. But uh, I think a channel swimmer has a much broader uh, scope of things they have to consider and plan for and execute versus an, a swimmer. You know, Quinn, you were talking about hitting the flip turn. Yes, that is absolutely critical. But also critical is what people will be in Antonio's boat to give him the best shot at completing this 67 kilometer double crossing. Uh, Antonio, you have any comment on that? What you're saying is, <laughs> uh, you were driving yesterday with your daughters, yeah. um, and I, I would, I would, I was thinking about the times we would drove to the pool. You know, when I was at the Anza or when I was at Stanford or here in Mexico, and, and that's a lot of uncertainty. And and you know, the, the problem with with pool swimming, if you you think about it, is you only have one chance. Your whole year is one chance. And if you miss that, you're gone. And uh, in, in channel swimming is, you have this freedom that you can come back anytime you want, number one. And number two, I guess, I guess in my case, my, my boat team is, you know, we've been together for many, many years. So I have no, no, no issues about that. I mean, I know Rafa is going to be the, the, you know, he's the, 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 the my coach and the general manager of the team and Ricardo will be there and, and, uh, and uh, Ariadna and Maria Paula and everybody knows what they have to do. So I, I'm never concerned about that. You know, the only thing that has concerned me these days is that the whole team needs to be vaccinated and, uh, and, and we're working on that. I mean, that, if you ask me, which is the, the only thing that makes me nervous and I don't think about it, is what's gonna happen with the opening of the borders in England. Um, but that, that, that would be my... my my, my concern, I, I really, I, I, again, I guess, I guess my, my, when I was younger and I was swimming competitively, um, it meant so much, yeah, this is good, what I'm thinking. My life circled around swimming. My life was swimming. So if I didn't do well, it was something in terms of my life, it was a big chunk of my life, yeah. you know? I, I, I even thought about going to other universities just because I thought I would swim better. And now swimming is my enjoyment. It's something that's part of a brother, um, Antonio, and it's just a small part in my life. It's a big part, but it's also a small part. So yeah. probably that's, that's the reason why I think it differently. Yeah. I, I wanna go uh, now shift to a taper. And this is really, this is a really important topic uh, for the Tokyo Olympics. In to- Tokyo Olympics, especially on the men's side, the, some of the best open water swimmers, some of the guys who will have a, the highest probability of getting an Olympic medal in the marathon swim, also have a very, very good shot at winning a gold medal in the 1500 meter freestyle and the 800 meter freestyle. So I don't know how these athletes actually do it. They will swim the heats of the 800 meter free, then the finals of the 800 meter free, then the heats of the 1500 meter free, then the finals of the 1500 meter free. And four days later, or I'm sorry, five days later, do the 10K marathon swim. They have, you know, probably three to four of the top athletes you know, some of the, the favorites to win the, the Olympic medal, they have to swim five events, two 800 frees, two 1500 meter frees, and a 10K swim. Um, I, ha- I am quite fascinated in how they're gonna taper for, for this. Um, now there's other people, let's say Ferry Wortman, he won the Olympic medal in the 10K swim in Rio. He's one of uh, uh, Holland's or uh, the Netherlands' best 200 uh, swimmers. He, in fact, he represented 
uh, the Netherlands and um, some of the, the 800 meter relays, but he's also arguably the best open water swimmer on the planet. And, and I don't know how these guys work in a taper both to compete against the best in the pool and the best in the open water at the same time. Now, other than those four or five exceptional athletes, pool swimmers and open water swimmers can and don't mix open water swimming and, and pool swimming. Although on the American side, I'm quite sure that our top three, I'm sorry, all of our top uh, female swimmers will be swimming events at the Olympic trials. So Haley Anderson, um, Ashley Twitchell, Erica Sullivan, and a pretty special girl, um, Catherine Grimes, who's competing right now this week in uh, Florida. Yesterday, she was very competitive. I think she got fourth in the 10K swim yesterday. Today, she won the junior 5K swim. Tomorrow, she's going to swim the 7.5. So she's swimming against national competitors, the 10K, 5K, and 7.5 three days in a row. Um, I don't know how those people train, I, I, I taper. It, it, to me, it's mind boggling. And perhaps uh, Quinn, one day we can, we can ask them to share their secrets because they are secrets. Um, no, none of the, these coaches will share what they do. Uh, but Antonio, in your case, you, you mentioned you don't really taper, but you do, you're hitting your peak now. About how many weeks before your swim will be your longest swim that you do or your toughest swim that you do for the double crossing? No, we're going in uh, May 13 and 14, we're doing 24 hours. Okay. That's going to be the, the peak. Okay. And then up. Six weeks, seven weeks before your planned swim? Yeah. And okay. then after that, uh, um, as Rafa says, we have a period of uh, just small adjustments and, you know, we do some, some speed and we continue with weights and then, you no, know, we do taper, but it's not, it's not the, the, the pool tapering. I mean, the pool tapering is, you know, you just go from this much to this much. I mean, it's just, to me, it was a big difference. But let me just go back to what you said about the, the swimmers, you know, 800, 1500, and then the, the, the 10K. Um, you know, that three different ball games. I mean, it's just it, not only how they taper, but how they approach each one of those races. And what it comes to my mind is that the 10K, even though it's, it's much longer, is still a race that you go all out. I mean, you have to be able to go, it's like the marathon at the highest speed possible during the whole, during the whole swim. So that would be really interesting. But let me ask you one thing. Ledeski is not going in, into open water swimming? No. She doesn't like it because she would be, or, or what, 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 any reason that, 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 that you know that why she wouldn't go there? I mean, she just dominates the pool. Yeah, well, there's a few reasons. Um, I, I don't know all of them. Her, um, her club coach was a very good open water coach, um, but she also was in parts of the country that, are not so big in open water swimming. Now that she's up at Stanford, yeah, she's sort of part of uh, in the Bay Area, but um, most Stanford swimmers don't compete in the open water. I'm talking at the highest level. Whereas I look at Cal Berkeley, no offense, Antonio, but the Cal Berkeley swimmers do compete in things like the Tiburon Mile and other, other events in the Bay Area. So sometimes it's just the culture of the, the swim team that you're, you're in, but by far Katie Ledecky could dom she could get another gold medal, I believe, just taking it out faster than everybody and nobody could ever catch her. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nobody. Yeah, she, yeah, nobody. Um, it would have to be very, very rough water or very, very cold water for her for other people to be competitive with. But she's just aerobically better than everybody. Um, but you know, maybe she's, she's so good aerobically in the pool because that's where her entire focus is. If she had to mix things up, maybe she would be a little bit lesser in the pool, but I, you know, she's so good. Uh, she's such a unique 
uh, talent. Um, but we also have to look at Grant Hackett. Grant Hackett is um, uh, the, at the time, let's see, 2008, he was quite dominant in the uh, 1500 freestyle. Yeah. Uh, but at the Olympic um, uh, selection meet, he got 11th and he got disqualified. Um, I think what he did is he, he didn't taper like the other athletes did and, and, he, and he sort of panicked in the last part of the race. And unfortunately he, you know, he created two yellow card infractions and, and you know, he didn't qualify. So here, here he was the top, very, very top, uh, the, you know, 1500 meter world and he couldn't um, uh, qualify for the Olympics. So, you know, strange things happen in the open water, but um, you know, it, and, that's what, and that's what we like about open water. You know, the, the unexpected usually happens and we just deal with it. Definitely. You know, one thing about open water is that you're never going to know what's going to happen. It's always the uncertainty. And that's, yeah. as you say, it's a beauty of, uh, of being in the ocean and being with, uh, in, in contact with nature. Yeah. Yeah. And then, um, uh, Antonio, you, you and I have had this discussion now for, for many weeks. Uh, we're, we're in the second half of the swim, but some of the people on the call today, they don't know what you normally do in the course of a week. I know every week is, is different, but you, can you summarize for people what you do on dry land, um, how you prepare for your swims with the foam roller and stretching, and then what, what is your pool, river, and ocean training like? Yeah, Those Steven, are... we, we work on a four-week cycle, um, and, and uh, Rafa is here with us today. So Rafa, if you want to say something that when I finish, just go ahead. Um, unmute yourself and, and do it. Um, so we work in four, in four week cycles. And in one week, I do two times a week, I do strength exercises, uh, usually Monday or Wednesday or Monday and Thursday. And then uh, um, Wednesday, it's painful day. I know Wednesday is going to be the, uh, the toughest workout of uh, whatever our goal is. Like for two weeks ago, um, it was speed, and I had to do those 3100s that I, that I mentioned. Um, Tuesday is um, a lot of kicking. Um, and as you've, you've seen in the videos, my kick has, you know, that was one of our, our goals was that I would rotate better and that I would kick more. So Tuesday, we do, we, we do that um, and, uh, and on Thursdays. And in those days, we do um, speed changes. Like we go one eight hundred, and uh, maybe the first one eight hundred will go like four eight hundred, and the first one would be twelve point five, and then recovery twenty five, twelve point five, and then recovery, and we do different different stretches, different uh, uh, um, uh, distances. Then one or two days we do, um, how would you say the the things that I do with my body and the rollers and the ball and yeah. It's like athletic fitness uh, with my body. And, um, and then usually Fridays, it's a little bit, uh, uh, a little bit you know, less, less, less meters because the first Saturday of the month or, or the cycle, we do 10 1000s. Um, and and in, in different, we break it in different ways. But usually the ninth is 1075s all out. Okay, and the only thing that matters for the day is the last 1,000. So you have to go for timing. And that's very painful, Stephen. I get the same jitters that if I would do a, a 400, <laughs> you know, just to think about that last 1,000, you know, it puts a lot of nervousness in me. Um, it's have, I concentrate the whole Friday night and Saturday morning on, on that. And then on Sundays, I go and walk. The second weekend, we go to Las Estacas which is a river in uh, close to Mexico City. And we train usually there for three or four hours. And we, we swim against the current. And Rafa usually puts me sets, um, different sets on, on going up the current at different speeds. And, what, and the nice thing about there is that we, we have three different routes. And so um, we choose and we think about what's gonna be happening at the double, uh, the double channel. You know, we, we've, we've come with the, 
we've broken the, the swim in four segments, starting in England to the half, the half to France, thinking that we're gonna have a very rough time getting into France, which that can happen, you know, um, if, if you if you lose the curve, you, if you lose the tide, that's gonna happen. But if you don't lose the tide and you're going out, you're gonna again, it's gonna you're gonna be going against the tide. So France is gonna be a problem anyway. Uh, or you have to think it as being something that you need to be concerned and you need to work mentally, then we'll go to the second half and then the last half um, going into into England is just going to be hopefully plenty of um, of enjoyment because I'm going to be much closer to finishing. Yeah. And then and then the third week I used to try to go to California to La Jolla and probably in June and July. I'll, I'll be in in, uh, in, uh, in San Francisco again, just just to get more cold water, and um, and then the fourth weekend is I just swim about six thousand or seven thousand on Saturday on a more relaxed pace. So that's that's basically a four week cycle, and this is what happens um, every week. Yeah. Rafa, Rafa, quieres comentar algo tú? <laughs> no, no, Antonio, está bien, está perfecto lo que hablas. <laughs> Dale, gracias, Rafa. So and, Rafa, um, Rafa, Rafa says, I, I've been taking good notes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but also what is really remarkable, and, and I always like this about uh, marathon swimmers or channel swimmers and competitive pool swimmers, is that they are consistent. They rarely miss a workout. If, if a workout is missed, it's usually because of an injury or some... Uh, bad illness. And Antonio, in this last year, since the pandemic ended, well, the pandemic uh, restrictions ended and you could start swimming in a pool, how many workouts have you missed between last year and, and yesterday? None. Yes. And how many workouts <laughs> did you miss, let's say, uh, when you were a competitive swimmer in your young Three. days? Three. Three total. Over how many years, approximately? Probably seven or eight, maybe yeah. a little more. You know, and, and, and as I told you and Quinn, one of that was to go to my first concert <laughs> uh, at Candlestick Park, Peter Frampton. Yeah. So you know, I, I I I was so I was so excited to go to a concert because in those days concerts were prohibited in Mexico. Oh. So uh, I went to the concert and uh, I learned a lot in that concert. Um, I have to say. <laughs> did, you, but, did you miss the day after the concert or did you miss the day of the concert? I missed the day of the concert. Okay. No, we, we, we trained the day, the day and um, we didn't train that morning because, uh, you know, we had to get a ride. I had to get a ride with somebody else that uh, a friend of mine from the team and uh, he said, well, we need to go early. So because we didn't have seats in those, you know, I, I guess... Uh, you have to arrive early if you want to have a good a good space you have to arrive early yeah. so he decided we needed to arrive very early so we arrived very early because it was garden it was concert on the green that's how it was called in those days concert on the green and uh and uh and a lot of green passed around too um and, <laughs> and uh but that was that and then one day that i was so sick that my coach in mexico told me he didn't want to see me that day or the next the day after Got it. You know, you, as you see, I don't know why, but I guess, you know, when you're a competitive swimmer, you know that every swim counts. So when I'm really tired and, and, I, and, I, and I, I would like to, to, to take a rest, I just, you know, usually when I'm doing weights and you're at rep number eight or number 10 and you have to go 12 or when I'm doing push-ups uh -huh. and I'm very tired, I'm just thinking, if I miss this once, I'm probably going to miss the tide. Uh, if I miss this once, I probably won't make it all the way to, to, to the, other, the, the other side. And when I used to swim, I always thought about that. If I missed a workout, you know, the, the guy in the next lane I was going to be better prepared than me. And I just didn't want to happen. Yeah, yeah. I, and I also want to uh, um, inform everybody on this uh, phone call that, that Antonio uh, will attempt uh, to become the oldest man and the oldest overall person to cross the English Channel two times. Uh, the current uh, world record holder is uh, a British woman 
from the Isle of Jersey, Sally Minty Gravit. Um, she swam uh, two ways across the English Channel and she was 56 years old at the time. She did it in, um, oh no, wait a second. 32 hours. Yeah, 30, yes, 30, no, 36 hours. And 26. And uh, her second lap coming back was, was uh, oh, I'm sorry, she was 59 years old. So she was 59 years old and she did a 36 hour, 26 six minute crossing. Antonio, that is your target um, in terms of age. Uh, and then last week I wanted to, to mention, um, uh, we had mentioned that you were the oldest person um, to do the Ocean 7. Um, uh, you were when you, when you did it. Um, and then a, another young woman, a woman a few months older than you, uh, Elizabeth Fry, became the oldest woman and the oldest over, overall. So you have a lot of competition, Antonio. And that's the, the, another issue that I'd like to delve into. In open water swimming, we have a lot of like, male and in the pool, obviously male and female are separated. Throw us in the channel and uh, women are very, very competitive with men. And in cases like uh, Sarah Thomas and, and uh, Elizabeth Fry, they outdo the men in various ways. Do you ever feel competition against women or you just looking no. at them? You know, I, I, I have something that I learned about my guess, life very early in my life. When I realized that I was not going to be able to go to the Olympic Games and the day I quit swimming, I promised myself I was never going to race again um, in swimming, you know, competitively, you know, try to compete. And that's us, you know, I compete in the pool and I like, but I never, I, you mentioned two, two, two swimmers that are very, you know, Elizabeth and Sally, I, I consider them not only outstanding, um, swimmers, but they're very good friends of mine. And, you know, they're great, uh, great, uh, great, great, uh, uh, friends. Um, no, I, I, I guess, I'm glad Jimena is not around because I would be scolded because of what I'm going to say. In my case, and I guess in, in terms of the men in open water swimming, we're more relaxed about competition. Um, women, on the other hand, they get more intense about competition. Uh, and, uh, and no, but I never compete. I, I always look up to them. And, and, uh, and as a matter of fact, Sally gave me a lot of insights okay. on what 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 how to do the 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 double she was going to be with me in um in my my attempt of uh catalina and then um she couldn't make it um or something happened i can't remember but she she was very uh she's been very open anytime i ask her for for advices and and i think that's something that we many of us share i mean yeah. if anybody calls me and asks me for advice i i I usually answer, and, when, and the same thing, when I go and ask for advice, people are very comfortable in giving it to me. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, Quinn, I'd like to open it up. I mean, there's a lot of questions, a lot of interest on various things that we discussed from taper, mental differences, uh, gender competitiveness. Um, any questions for Antonio? Just unmute yourself and fire away. English or Spanish? Anyone? I'll look in the chat room and... Um, Suzanne, you made it. Yeah. Uh, here, here's one that, you know, this is, uh, we could go on and on for days on this, but what are the difficulties in swimming the Ocean 7, Antonio? I guess the number one is the, the North Channel, which is very cold. And then the second one is Molokai Channel which is very long and very, and very warm. So you have two big, that's the challenge of Ocean 7. In between, you're gonna have something like Molokai, 42 kilometers with very big, big, big waves and, and hot water. And then you'll have the North Channel, which is gonna be very, very cold. Um, and in between, you know, so that's swimming wise, I would say those are the big differences in between you have um, differences in, in the ocean. But, but, but I think, 
the most difficult thing these days is getting a boat. For example, Gibraltar, again, this year is going to be closed for crossing. You know, trying to get uh, um, our friend in New Zealand, uh, um, what's his name? Uh, well, you know, the, 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 the person who does New Zealand, to get him to answer you an email can take three months. So it's, uh, you know, it's a complication of nature and, 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 and demand, I guess the demand for, for slots on any of the Ocean 7 has increased a lot and then getting people to, to, to answer. And after that, training every day for at least two or three years to be able to complete all the swims. Yeah. And Tony, you train down at um, Acapulco Bay in Mexico. Do you ever do any of the competitive open water swims there? I know they have some, some very, very popular races. Yeah, I did in my younger age. I, I, I won them two times, but no, I, there's too many people. I, I've, you know, one thing that I've become with age, I've become a, a um, you know, I don't like to be in crowds anymore. So I guess that's, that's part of being, getting, being an old man like I am now, 62, Stephen. 62, I know. <laughs> so, so in other words, uh, you have uh, 11 more years before you can even think about breaking the oldest record for the English Channel Crossing, which is held by uh, Dr. Otto Thani. Of, yes. Uh, and you know what happened to me? I was so happy, and I don't know how that happened, uh, but I was asked to, give a, um, to give a, a, make a video for his birthday. Okay. Um, his daughter asked me, you know, I, I, I wrote him once when he, when he did that, I wrote him and I asked him, how have you, how, you know, I was intrigued. I said, how did you, have you kept it uh, in shape? And so he told me what, what he's, what he does. So I wrote him, I said, you know, you know how fast he was when he did that at 72 or 73? No. It was about 12 hours. No, <laughs> no, no. 12 right. hours at 72 or 73 crossing the English channel. So I, I said in the I said in the in the in the in the video that I congratulate him that I put that I wanted to try it. So I'll I'll keep on swimming. I I I told you my one of my grandchildren is gonna swim with me when I turn 80, Catalina, and we're gonna go in tandem. Yeah, yeah. The other thing that I wanted to um, ask, and maybe this is something that Rafa could actually uh, address in addition to you, Antonio, is technique. Now, technique is extremely important. The proper stroke mechanics are extremely important in the pool, but they also are becoming extremely important in the open water. When I, you know, when I see the best open water swimmers now, they have perfect body position. They, they, they roll very well. Um, and it, it's, it's very nice to see most open water swimmers now understand the importance of not just grinding it out, but improving your stroke technique so every every arm pull is as efficient as possible. Rafa, ¿quieres contestar a la técnica? Eh, hablas de la técnica en el mar, ¿no? Sí, la técnica en el mar. Me, me vas traduciendo porque la última jornada no sirvió para mucho. Este, que lo, primero, lo principal de la técnica tuya este año fue mejorar el rolido Y la patada, ese era el objetivo fundamental, ¿no? When we started, when we started the season, um, we, we worked, we had two goals in terms of our te my technique. Number one is kicking, and number two was usually what you said, to bring my body up and be able to roll. So we, we did a lot of work from day one when this, the season started. So that's what Rafa just said. Después. La, la segunda es eh, visualizar el, el mar. Este, cuando el mar, la entrada, la, 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 las olas, cómo atacar la ola, sobre todo el mar picado, para la abrazada profunda. ¿Te acuerdas? El jalón y el agarre profundo. ¿Lo recuerdas? Sí. You know, you know Steven, when, you, when, you're facing, when, when you're facing an ocean or water that's very unstable with a lot of waves, small waves or big waves, but especially this, the, the small waves, when you put your arm in, it's totally different than when you're in the pool. Yeah. You need to find a, you need to find a new position to be able to do your 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 stroke to to just to be able to handle it. 
And um, and, and, and in my case, when I stop swimming in the ocean and I go back the first day, it's really difficult. But we have that's why we keep on going back to 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 the ocean once a month because that's something that uh, we know we need to work. And that's the second thing we work in technique. I mean, how do we do my pooling when the when the ocean is rough? ¿Y qué más, Rafa? No, que junto con el jalón aplicar mucho más rolido, la abrazada profunda y aplicar mucho más rolido del lado contrario donde viene el oleaje por el tema de la respiración. Yeah, ¿Ah? and the other thing is to, to roll my body more on the opposite side that where, where, from where the waves are coming from. So I do more rolling in my, in my, in my swim. Yeah, good, good. I, actually, Quinn, I think this is- and, a but, but you know what, you know what, Steven, let me interrupt you. But you know one thing I'm still cannot do? And I was told by a friend the other day that that is one of the things that doesn't qualify me to be named a great swimmer, great open water swimmer. That I still swallow salt water, Steven. Uh. I oh. still swallow salt water. I mean, it's a, you know, I haven't been able to, to do that. So, you know, uh, my, my goal between now and when I cross back and forth, or I try crossing back and forth, is not swallow salt water. Okay. So, so I have two techniques or two drills that people can do to uh, help uh, understand uh, the placement of your mouth in rough water. The first is do as muddy surfing as possible. Now that may not be possible for anyone who doesn't uh, live by a, a, a beach with waves, but usually body surfers, you quickly learn when you're body surfing over and over again, when not to open your mouth uh, when you're catching the wave. And the second is um, if you are fortunate enough to live by the ocean, you swim directly in the surf zone. So if the, if the, uh, shore is on my left shoulder and the waves are coming in my right shoulder, you swim right through for at least a kilometer in through the waves. And you, you will be taught by mother nature when not to open your mouth. You always become very aware. And usually if you do these uh, two drills after about a month or so, people start to learn when to uh, breathe and not breathe. Now, if you're only training in a lake or in flat bay water, well, that's not possible. But um, if you have access to an ocean, body surfing and then swimming parallel to the, the waves is a, is a good way to learn um, timing of your uh, breathing. I, I will try that this, uh, this next week in, in San Diego. Okay, yeah. I'll, I'll, be, I'll, I'll be down there with you. I'll, I'll report to our audience next week, how did, how did I fare? Okay. And, and Quinn, I think we should actually have a very good discussion next week with technique in the open water for, for flat water, for when you're tired, when your shoulder's hurting, um, and when it's very wavy. I think that would be a very a good discussion to have. Great idea. Yeah. Well, Antonio, I will see you next week. Yes. Uh, in Antonio, in California, body surfing and uh, training hard. Yes. It'll be a pleasure seeing you. You thank you to everybody.